a western and an eastern side. And I think Alex's trip is on the western side. But um, Alex is a uh, registered Maine guide, and he has a lot to offer about his thoughts uh, about the trip down the river and nature and his philosophy that goes with it. He is also a uh, professor at Hudson College, or university now, I'm sorry. So, um, and where he teaches philosophy. So with no further information about Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex and let him take you down the Penobscot River. Hi, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and th uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you to the library for having me here. I'm excited to get to share uh, some photos from my trip, some stories from the trip as well, and also just uh, a little bit of this weird idea of connecting philosophy with uh, trips in nature. Uh, I will be sharing my screen as a, a slideshow of PowerPoint um, so you can follow along with that. And then there's gonna be time for questions at the end. Um, and the way we'll do that is that if you can type your questions into the chat, um, it'll be sort of the most orderly way to get to those. Uh, feel free to start questions early, um, you know, so that you remember it, but it'll be, you know, the talk will be uh, probably about an hour long with hopefully about 20 minutes or more of questions at the end. So um, yeah, look forward to getting your all thoughts and questions that come from this. So I will share my screen now and get this underway. All right. So uh this trip that i took last summer it ended up being five nights i had much bigger goals um and that wasn't the reality uh i had hoped to start on the south branch very near the canadian border but um we had a, a drought this year and so there was didn't look like there would be enough water so i ended up starting downstream of canada falls on the south branch uh below the last set of rapids there so sort of uh, probably about two miles uh, upriver there. And my original goal had also been to paddle all the way down to the bay. Um, but as I learned, um, you don't really paddle from Millinocket to Medway. Uh, there are a lot of very serious dams there. Um, so with that sort of bigger picture and in some ways this, this smaller trip that, that happened, it's, I noticed this thing as I talked about the trip that it often, the failure was what came first in the story. Um, and that's not really what the trip is for me. It's the many days of sort of just really getting to enjoy being in this beautiful place um, and traveling and experiencing places I've been many times, but in a new way, uh, getting, getting to do it by myself. And, that mixture of telling wilderness stories as challenge, failure, success, versus telling it about just the immediate experience of being there was actually one of the reasons I went on this trip. And that's really one of the things I want to focus on in this talk. So, The planning, the packing for this trip, you can see there the golden boat is the one I took. It is a uh, 16 foot, it used to be a tandem boat, but I re-outfitted it as a solo boat. And those bags there, that's my gear for the trip. Um, ended up being a lot more food than I needed. Um, but I started off with that, spent time working through maps, talking to people I knew, um, and just planning out what would be the route, what would be sort of my backup plans, how could I get out of there. But I was also, you know, this is a, in the weird way, it's a philosophy expedition. So like a scientist would have to plan their, their experiments, that kind of thing. And I had a question or sort of a series of questions that were, was in my mind as I was working on this. And I really wanted to sort of focus in on how do you explain the experience of being out in the woods? 
because it's not to me an experience of suffering of pain even when it has those the like deeper part of this has a lot more to do with just this sense of sort of immediacy of being there and this is a question i've been trying to think through for a while and so as I was planning for this trip and sort of even in like about the year before I was reading, I was thinking a lot about this sort of trying to understand the connection between ourselves and nature. And I was looking at philosophers who talk about a mind body connection rather, rather than a mind body split to make sense of that. And so as I was thinking about it really I found in adventure stories that they focus not on our connection to nature, they focus on the sort of overcoming of it, the challenge that is faced there. And so a lot of times these beautiful places, animals, all of these parts of nature sort of become a part of this disconnected story. And so starting out with this look at how we talk about nature is was working towards this trip but before this there was a previous trip that i think is worth talking about so not this summer the summer before i did a trip with a group of visual artists and philosophers it was a four-night expedition on the upper west branch of the penobscot so that was um day two and three of my trip. Uh, it turns out when you're by yourself and you're kind of bored, you can go a lot further. So it was on this same stretch of river. Everyone came with sort of their own projects. Uh, some, uh, you know, the visual artists were finding sort of new resources for uh, paintings, drawings, photographs. The philosophers sort of were using this as a chance to think about things that they were interested in. and. I was sort of pushing them into an experiment a little bit of this thing I'm calling participatory philosophy. Um, and it's kind of a joke. It's kind of my Plimptonian, uh, you know, a little bit of a, we're just, we have this question, how do you think about your connection to nature? Well, while on a trip, well, you go on a trip and think about it and maybe there'll be something new that happens when you're out there. And so the ideas behind this, the, the thinkers I was looking to, so it's a library talk, so we should look at some books while we're here, uh, is from Gabrielle Marcel, who's a French uh, phenomenologist and existentialist. He has this idea of the metatechnical, and he is saying that the words we use, the thought, the words we use shape the thoughts that we think can be real. So when we say, I have a body, we make our body a possession of ours. And so we are separating our mind and our body. When we say I am embodied, which is a very weird thing and no one actually speaks this way, but we begin to see sort of our body as one aspect of us. And then from Henry Bugby, who's a American philosopher, sort of very focused on the experience of wilderness. Um, he notices this gulf between our analysis and our activity. So when we talk about things, we expect a sort of precision, consistency, cleanness of those ideas that isn't actually what we experience. And so his push was to make philosophy closer to the actual activity than the analysis of it. And he has this idea that the way he defines wilderness is that it's being in community with things. And what he means by that is when you are in the woods, you respect the objects you interact with because you aren't sure what they are. You aren't sure what they will do. Where in our sort of everyday life, you know, we go through and the things we interact with, they just do what they're gonna do, what we expect of them. So most of us are probably sitting in a chair, sitting in a couch. Like you didn't give it a second thought when you sat on it. You didn't check its legs to make sure it would work. It, and it's doing its job so you forget about it. 
and he sees the world or wilderness as the place where that's not really possible. So participatory philosophy, this thing I was pushing these people unknowingly into, I see it as an extension of sort of Bugby's attempt at a philosophy from the actual human stance. So thinking about the thing you're actually doing in the moment and trying not to lose any of the sense of meaning it has at the time. Trying to think from your actions. So what I asked them to do, and this is again that story part of it, was I asked them to watch the words they used. Were they telling stories that focused on struggles? Were they speaking about things as active or passive? Were they the only active one? Was the place passive? And trying to get a balance in the types of stories they told while they were doing this. So instead of I went to the wilderness, these stories of overcoming, self-discovery, the fun of suffering, and the certainty of like, I now know what I'm capable of in, in full things, these, I think, are the usual stories we tell. I tried to get them to tell the I was canoeing story. So they're putting themselves in the passive voice, letting the place sort of have an emphasis there. And really talk about the interaction with things. What did you gain from sort of respecting the thing, being in community with it, and trying to decenter the human in the experience? So I was one being on the river in this day and just trying to sort of think through what it meant to think from that sort of with that kind of storytelling and we had adventures we had things that could have been stories of overcoming in fact we got a hole in one of our canoes we had some really old wood canvas canoes and one hit a rock and we had to patch it um, we were in unfamiliar places. We paddled into the wind. It was a hard day. But we managed to find ways to tell that story that wasn't about just us. It was about this whole sort of situation. And in truth, the hole in the canoe, we were not in danger. We were able to, to deal with it very easily. And it's just something that happens to old boats. Rocks, rock breaks wood. You know, it's not, a, it's not a radical truth. It's just what happens. So I came away with a sense that the ideas of Marcel and Bugby, that there really was something going on there. And we were able to feel these moments of crisis. They weren't, they didn't become central. They became a part of this larger whole. And so there is this sense I had at the end that crisis and simplicity or crisis and peace or whatever we want to say is the opposite, that they're both equally real. And that wasn't really the point of that trip. The point was the sort of storytelling part. And this became what I really wanted to look at on this solo trip. So the focus that, that I was working towards was trying to clarify this active philosophy without sort of forcing other people to do it, take some time on my own to do it. And I have been really worried about something. Well, we all probably on this Zoom are really worried about climate change. The world is getting more dangerous. Um, but I am also worried that we have moved more and more to a language of the environment as problematic. And I think that we need to work, we need to figure out how to express the problems, the dangers, the worries without moving into this nature will kill humans sort of separated story. And so without be making nature just a crisis. You know, as I traveled this summer, I went through places affected by dams, currently affected by climate change, but there's also a, a vibrancy there. And that's still, both are real. So how do we keep both at the same time? How do we think without becoming grounded only in the problem? So 
this leads us to the South Branch coming out onto Sabumic Lake. If you go to the program next week, you'll learn a lot of names of uh, places on uh, the on the Penobscot River. And you, one of the things about Sabumic Lake is I'm pretty sure it's the wrong name. I'm pretty sure Sabumic Lake originally was Moosehead Lake, and we uh, mess, messed that up along the way. But even on this first day, paddling alone, it felt different than other trips. It wasn't scarier. And I think this is the, in some ways surprised me is, I spent very little time thinking about how I was in a more dangerous situation because I was alone. The times that happened was, you know, I had a rapid coming up and I had to remind myself, yes, you paddle that with other people, but you're here alone. But this moving through the water at the pace that I went at, not needing to go faster, not needing to go slower, not needing to sort of connect with what the group needed, it was this simple and peaceful feeling. Each paddle stroke did what it needed to do. I didn't have a set campsite every night. I went sort of as far as I could. I generally checked the time once a, about once a day early evening to see if I could make it to the next campsite. A lot of days I didn't look at the map until sort of that probably around like four o'clock to figure out you know how many miles to the next campsite can I do it now or should I stop where I am. So it would be this day with just zero idea of what time it was. And you know, often I would be surprised at the amount of distance that was covered. Um, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a trophy, it was just this sort of interesting aside of, oh, I'm getting here now, I'm approaching the dam. And, you know, this is the sunset on the first night. Uh, and, you know, in camp that first night, I was really spending time thinking about what was going on in the world. I was thinking about uh, my family. I was thinking about my wife, who is now stuck with uh, our two dogs. Um, and I'm pretty sure I found out about an hour out of town that our hot water heater broke. Um, so there was a little bit of guilt going on. Um, and there was sort of the struggle of which, which is important, what's going on. But the next day, heading downriver again, uh, getting moving cleared my mind. It was again this sort of connection to the activity of moving down this river. It was also fun because at the start you get the Sabumic section, so you get some rapids in there. Um, but then I got onto the main branch of the West Branch. And if you look right in the middle, there's a moose there. Um, and he was uh, young. I don't, his antlers hadn't hadn't he didn't have antlers yet um, and he was out in the middle and when he saw me he went all the way to the right bank ran along them decided to swim across the river and go to the other side <coughs> um, so here he is sort of figuring out what i'm up to not sure what he wants goes that way now here's swimming across the other way um, as I was paddling that day, and this was sort of one of the ones that set this goal, I really wanted to be able to pass a bird, a moose, without it changing its activity. And I did not succeed in that. No matter how quiet I got, no matter how far to the other side I went, you know, I continued to sort of disturb them. They were not happy about this 16-foot gold thing traveling around. So they kept reminding me that I was not one with nature. You know, this was not Alex goes to the wild immersion story and I commune with every animal. Um, but it still was, you know, it was different than being there with a large group. I got to get closer. I got to sort of see by being quiet, got to see some animals I hadn't seen before. And, you know, I saw what I'm pretty sure is a baby eagle. And if you know me well, you know that I'm not a great birder, but I saw this sort of 
downy, fluffy, uh, grapefruit size, gray bird that, I, you know, was, I think, a, a baby or a young, very young bald eagle. And it was beautiful. It was fun. And then I paddled away and realized, I'm pretty sure that bird's going to die. Um, it is by itself. So there's, you know, even this connectedness doesn't mean everything is great. Everything is, you know, this Disney movie. Um, none of the animals spoke. So now on Chisungkuk Lake, uh, and this is the start of day three. So this is early in the morning, and this day was uh, just a remarkable day. I, you know, this was June when I took the trip. It was before the solstice, and the, you know, the sun was just up so early. So it meant there were just hours of light before the wind picked up. And this day in particular was just dead calm. It was pure glass. And, you know, I was from the day before all the animals along the West Branch, I was working through this idea of, I'm definitely not one with nature, but I kept coming back then to this idea that, you know, we get from Joseph Conrad of, nature is indifferent to us. Our relation to nature is its indifference. And as I paddled along this flat water, and there was a group of probably about 50 Canada geese, and I ruined their morning, and they decided to follow me for about half an hour, honking at me to remind me that I ruined their morning. Um, but just with this calm piece, uh, I just had trouble, and I've already had trouble beforehand with Conrad's view of nature as indifferent. It's not that I see nature as caring at all about me, but it really seems like my connection's not to nature. You know, it is, and to, to even say, oh, nature is indifferent to me, is to do a really weird thing because nature is not a thing, it's not an object, it's not a being that relates to individuals. Um, so my connection is not to this nature that cares or doesn't care about me, but it's to that rock, it's to the lake, it's to this place, it's to the animals I saw. And I don't know whether that rock cares about me or not, but that seems like a silly thing to expect of a rock or a lake. So but whether it's indifferent or not, just it, it seemed like a, as silly a thing to say about n nature or places as, you know, any of the sort of mythic versions of it we're trying to overcome. So just continuing on this day with these reflective waters and, hey, it got me a pun, so it's worth the, all the, the travel for that. Um, but coming to the end of Chisungkuk Lake, you know, opens up into Ripagenus Lake. And this is one of those places that it feels like it's been that way forever, but it hasn't. You know, these were rivers. Um, this opening did not, you know, didn't exist. And down, if you look at the, the first mountain range, the one with Katahdin in the background, uh, to the, you know, in the, in there is Ripagenus Dam, a very large dam that reshaped the river. Uh, Sabumic Lake, Chisungkuk Lake, really all of the lakes that I traveled on are, re, were reshaped by dams. So even this, this trip that was an immersive experience, it's not a wilderness experience. These are places that are clearly, um, changed by humans but yet knowing that it still is not and and you can even see a house along the shore and i was you i saw i was getting to where i would see the most people in the whole trip along the lower west branch but it still was not a human-centered place uh you know the the waves i dealt with on ripagenus lake even with motorboats nearby, were as serious as waves anywhere else. And 
this thing about nature being or defining wilderness as unhuman or define you know we, we lose that so then people start to want to define it as places that are tough to be in places that are dangerous you know we define it by the distance from a hospital like how hard it would be to get help and when i think back on this trip i have a hard time remembering if it was hard or easy um and it, neither of those words make sense for it. Like I was, I continually paddled, probably, you know, I could have paddled harder, but I was not paddling lightly. But it wasn't, that wasn't what it was about. That wasn't what I was experiencing. I mean, when I got to the end of Ripagenus Lake, I had a several mile portage. I went at the pace I could go. And the, the trip really is was not measured in easy hard struggle it was just measured in this i am in this experience it's 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 a nice or nice isn't the right word but i i was in it i guess is the the way i saw it and as i moved from as we moved from seeing wilderness as hard dangerous an interesting thing happens. We realize that we spend a lot of time in nature in our lives. And also it moves nature from something that, you know, people with money, with the ability to take time off work and with a particular wilderness vision do to this thing that all sorts of people do. It made, you know, in moving wilderness from this hard place that's remote and dangerous to a place where you're sort of apart, your view is decentered to this natural place. It made me realize that my childhood was full of nature experiences, whether it was going sailing, whether it was take a picnic at the beach, whether it was, you know, going on a bike ride that a lot of these things that would not be called wilderness experiences. They wouldn't be the sort of privileged view of true nature travel met all of those standards. So going out here alone sort of brought back in or brought this wider view of what that means. And it's always nice to have thoughts like that when you're looking at Katahdin. Now, so I finished, Finished my portage. I uh, there's a lot of little portages too when you decide that you're going to paddle down the lower west branch of the Penobscot. Um, the traditional canoe routes go way around the lower west branch. Um, there's a chain of lakes ported, or there's a few that either go north of it or south of it. Um, I there was a little bit of places in there I wanted to go to. It was what I was more used to. Um, so here we are. This is, I think, uh, below Nasada Hunk Falls. And uh, getting to do the lower section of the Lower West Branch, this is now, this is the first photo of a place on the river I had never been before the trip. Um, and so this was, you know, it was just every turn was fun. Like I knew there would be rapids. I didn't know where they would be. I didn't know which ones I paddle. And there are things like this that are called falls and they're not really, and it's great. You get to paddle it. Um, but this was where I felt like truly most remote. Um, and it's closer to Millinocket than anywhere else on the trip, but it just, it felt really like there was something ethereal about this stretch. And if you're, if you get a chance, this is the, the part I would recommend people go. You put in below the, the sort of uh, rapids at Avall Bridge um, and you can go from there and it's, it's a really beautiful section. Uh, so you just get, and it moves from the river to just this like web of lakes. And it, it's, it's hard to tell which lake flows into each one you can kind of, you can almost get lost, but not really, but it's just this, uh, just great stretch of water. And 
you know, the, it was cloudy, this light mist that just added to just the just really rich sense of being in here. And, you know, lots of loons. Uh, it was a, a great section. Uh, it did clear up at some points. And this is actually, um, this is the my last morning on the trip. So we're getting near the end. I'm getting, you know, Millinockets on the other side of that lake. Uh, and this is getting to the less wilderness part of the trip. And I would actually say that this was the hardest <laughs> in some ways, the scariest day of my trip. So humans don't actually always make things safer. Uh, it wasn't dangerous, but again, it's a beautiful stretch of river, but you know, if you look to the other side, there's an industrial uh, scene going on. And this was how the trip ended. Uh, I found this abandoned, uh, train track in East Millinocket and I started portaging. And turns out it was, even with trees growing through it, it was still trespassing to walk on that train track. And so someone actually called the East Millinocket police on me as I was portaging into town. They were very nice. Um, and that was the end of my trip. Um, but again, that's not what the story is about the, or the experience is about. It's about this whole time on the river and it's this um connection into to thinking about this experience and trying to think about these these places i'm i traveled through and what it was like and i come back from that trip and i can remember that sense of sort of peace connection that's on the trip. And as we move through our world right now, and we look at really real conflict, we look at really real environmental sort of dangers, um, and we look at political just terrible political situations and we look at these things and there's I think often in the move to nature there can be this idea that we're rejecting we're downplaying these human concerns is not as important and the reality is the connection of nature or the other answer is well that connectedness that simplicity you felt that's just a a nice feeling you had, but it's not as real as the disconnection, as the, the struggling, as the strife. And what I turn back to Bugby for, what I turn back to Marcel for, is this way of trying to hold both as real parts of our experience, real parts of our world. The world is, not, if we hold a view of the world that it is primarily disconnection and struggling, that is a limited view of the world. If we hold the, a view of the world that it is primarily connection, peace, these things we experience on trips, that is a limited view of the world. And so in addition to Bugby and Marcel, one of the people that has helped me make the most sense of the sort of experience of this trip is Val Plumwood. Uh, and she, her, the type of philosophy she does is called ecofeminism. And what they're looking to do is move away from a vision of the world that takes separation as the most real. So this will sound somewhat familiar and to overcome dualistic ways of thinking that say there is humanity and there is the world or in the natural world. And they're not saying that, you know, again, and Plumwood makes the same point that, you know, the disconnection is real, it's been made, it's been developed, but it's not the whole story and trying to tell this sort of mixed story. Um, so this trip to me 
moving from the South Branch down the Upper West Branch and the Lower West Branch, you know, it, it was about this place. It was about enjoying a place that I have a history of experience with. But it was also about making sense of sort of this larger question of what is our connection to nature. And as I finished, you know, those questions aren't fully answered for me. So I'm hoping to go back to the East Branch, the North Branch, the rest of the South Branch, the Main Branch, um, and continue this story about sort of these questions and the Penobscot. And, you know, one thing I would like to point out is this river is a river that has had a relationship with humans for thousands and thousands of years. And the lakes we see on it now are not the original lakes as we talked about before. And the place I had to stop in East Millinocket, it is a series of dams in Millinocket, East Millinocket, Medway, that regulate the flow. There is no human access past them for us, for the Penobscot people who this is still their river. And the, the fish that travel up and down the river are blocked by that. So even as this is a story of this, you know, feeling of connection in this river, this feeling of like, this is a free place, um, it also isn't, and that that disrupted my trip in part, but I think that it also in some ways is a helpful end to it because it's a reminder of the sort of the history of Europeans in Maine, the history of sort of our relationship to the environment and how that is sort of built upon the the previous inhabitants, uh, the Penobscot Nation and the Wabanaki people. So uh, to end on a land remembrance or a water remembrance, which I think might be more accurate in this case, um, that is, you know, remains an active part of the, the river and really the, some of the brightest spots in the future of the river still come from the Penobscot people and the work they've done to uh, open up more and more of it. So thank you all and i excited to see what questions might come. Um, thank you so much, Alex. That was so interesting. Um, there, the, the most recent question that we have is, can you please share the third author's name that you talked about of the ecofeminism book? Will do. I didn't get it and other people asked that question. It is Val Plumwood. Okay, and, and she actually wrote a book? She's written uh, many books. Okay, thank you, I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate the books that you suggested. I think we'll add them to our library collection. I think that'd be very useful, thank you. Excellent. Um, so th that was the only question in the chat. If anybody else has a question, please unmute yourself and um, ask the question and try not to have everybody at once. <laughs> oh, here's a question. Can you see that, Alex? So where, was, where did I feel the most flow um, sense of being? I would, so I think it's the, the Upper West Branch. It's either the Upper, so the Upper West Branch for me is just a very familiar place. And uh, river travel is, not only is it just nicer because you have the water, it is a lot, it just feels safer than lakes. The lakes I traveled were big. And so there was this 
concern of safety. So that separation was there. Um, so that, you know, that section of the Upper West Branch, it just, you know, it had this amazing thing to it. Then again, Chesuncook Lake that morning, you know, that was just a really wonderful morning. That ranks in my all-time favorite, you know, days on the water. Um, okay, does anybody else have a question? Like I said, you can unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. Oh, they're putting it all. Um. Uh, so April's asking what kind of rituals do I have for days on the water and I I'm not good at like doing the same thing more than once so I don't really like to me there isn't a lot of ritual going on but it is just this the closest thing I have to a ritual might be the forward stroke in a canoe. Like to me, that is like a deeply connecting. And it's this relationship between myself, how the human body works, the paddle and the water. And so just sort of slowing down and enjoying that feeling is probably something like a ritual. Um, and then Gilby, Gilby's asking about how did I feel about my equipment and planning? Uh, Gilby, I wish I, you know, I could always have more rope as someone has told me in the past, but I, it was like the gear worked well. Like I never had a concern based on the gear. I was carrying a lot more food than I needed. Um, it turns out when I'm by myself, I don't eat that much. Um, oh, geez. And How do you ask a Elizabeth's asking about uh, the possibility of risk created a sense of separation. Um, so just the, what I think sometimes in the experience of risk, it is a reminder of, or it pushes you to sort of focus on yourself and what, what could go wrong. And so it, everything again becomes about you. You, be, you can become centered in that. I don't like risk isn't always felt that way, but I think it, it like there is that chance for that to happen. Um, where as you know, as the risk continues that, that time on the lake, it, you may be able to work through that to, to that other sense of it is like, oh, risk is just a, a part of this. Um, something I thought a lot about with risk on the trip is the lake isn't dangerous. My choice to be on the lake right now is dangerous. Um, and that, even though that's like a centering thought, it, was all, it also felt more honest about what is going on. Uh, Judy's asking if I, want to do more solo trips and and yes i and this sometimes can be taken the wrong way by people who have traveled on canoe trips with me before i love traveling with other people but i i really also really enjoy traveling alone like there's just something remarkable about it i haven't spent that much time alone um and it to get to do it in a place i'm comfortable was a really nice thing. Um, now looking at Nick, Nick's question. So he's asking about if, if sort of approaching this trip through this philosophical question gave me a deeper sense um, or deeper connection. And I, I don't know. I think my first answer is yes, but I, I'm not sure that I ever travel without some kind of question like this. I think this is, you know, it's sort of a, a natural instinct for me. Uh, one of the ways that I think having a specific question helped me is it 
it became a sustained thought that went with the whole trip. So it wasn't moving in and out. And I think it, what it allowed me to do was develop ways of thinking uh, that, that helped me stay in that moment rather than, you know, I spent a lot less time thinking about like how many days I have left, questions like that, and could be sort of in that reflection. Uh, Jack is asking if there are any accidental swims. Yep, there were. Um, but I'm really good at swimming in rapids, so they were not a problem. Um, a question now about the animals sensing my approach. Uh, so, and noting that animals are always on alert. So yes, I guess in some ways it is, uh, it is the way they react to a lot of animals, especially large animals. Um, so maybe I was, that was something that I was hoping for that was uh, not actually possible. There's a theory I've been reading about in ecology and I'm, I'm gonna forget the name, but they're starting to focus on ecology in terms of stress, animal stress. And so they really wanna understand sort of fight or flight and they're, they're focusing on how much of an animal's life is spent worrying about other animals. And I think that there's a truth in that, but I also, and this is, goes back to the point about our experience of it. You know, something I noticed was like, these animals were, they were enjoying themselves. Like, I think Canada geese like being with each other. Like, yes, they're stressed out about a human around, but like, there's a, there's a social aspect and like even, you know, that moment before the animal sees you, you, you can watch their interactions and you look at sort of young mergansers and like, it's not just fear. There's, there's, I think there is a, you know, I think there's play going on. Whether, you know, I don't know if I could prove that to an ecologist, but I think that that, you know, it is, so it, the my I want to push this beyond just a human experience to a larger sense of experience. There was one question you missed earlier, Alex, about somebody asked about if a kayak would have been as effective on this um, kind of trip. Um, I think for everything but the portage, um, it, it would have been. Uh, I, yeah, to me, the, the canoe is a, is a special craft and is my favorite craft. Um, and I don't know if the kayaks forage stroke has the same ritualistic aspects. Um, but for the water parts, uh, the Upper West Branch would be a great place for like a longer sort of sea kayak, almost sea kayak. Uh, and then getting in, like if you put on below uh, A-Ball Bridge, that, that lower section, the Debskinag, and there's a loop there you can do the Debskinag Lake Loop. That would be a great place for sort of, you know, a 14 plus foot kayak. Um, you know, because you still would want to make some distance with it. Um, yeah, and you know, all of these locations, the camping is first come, first serve. So you, you pay by the day, but it means that when you're in these places, you can, like, you don't have to have this set agenda of like, we have to go big miles today. Like, so if it's a hard day, you can do, you can do less. So, you know, I think the, this stretch of the West Branch and the East Branch is the same. Um, it allows for a little bit more sort of free form travel, which is a, I think a good way if you have the sort of time and flexibility to do it. So someone's asking, what do I think is a good age to go on a canoe trip? So I have done canoe trips with 
seven-year-old twins and they had a great time. Um, there is one of the people commenting, Elizabeth Colmo, she, I believe, once told me that if you start before they can walk, it's even, or something about before they can walk or talk, they just think it's normal. Um, so, you know, I think it's really about your comfort as a parent, I think has more than the, than the child's comfort. Um, and it's, you know, it's about being creative and making sure that you aren't just paddling for 12 hour days that you're stopping, you're getting out exploring. But I mean, if the, if they like animals, if they like being outside, if they like playing in water, all those things are possible on a canoe trip. Uh, and now the question, were there bugs? Yes, uh, it was June, um, which is a buggy time, but there were not a lot of bugs on the water. Um, so that may have been part of why I <laughs> was on the water from like 5 a.m. to 6 p.m. My, my uh, camp routine was efficient. I got up, set up camp, cooked my meal, jumped in my tent. Um, and, but yeah, there turns out Maine has a lot of bugs when you're out in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's a comment about sort of over hunting by colonists, uh, instill the fear in the wild animals in America. Um, I haven't heard that before and I don't know how like I, I I'm, don't know how to comment on it. Um, I, yeah, I'm not, that's out of my expertise, I think. I would, yeah. Uh, question I have for people and people can put a comment if they want or they can just think about it. Um, do you all, have you all experienced that difference between the stories you tell about your trips and what actually happened on them? And I don't think it even has to be a wilderness trip or a nature trip. Like it can be a traveling trip, a vacation. Um, but do you find that like separation coming from like what the stories begin to focus on and then if you stop to think about it it's is it different than the, what the stories are definitely what was that i said definitely right. uh i think the stories the stories that get told are like um you know uh, it was so hard to go out into nature after working a night shift that I fell asleep on the first day at camp uh, in the in an open field and a ranger came and looked at me and you know whatever but that the real trip is so different from that and it's in the things that are hard to explain to people that the like best parts of it come yeah thank you So Jack is asking a question um, about rewilding. And uh, I, yeah, my hope is that removing the dam, restoring the fish runs can rewild these places. But I also want to push us to, to say that even though this place isn't in its full health when, it's dam when it has the dams restricting fish, that there's still something that, that is wild about it. There are still fish there that are healthy. There are still like birds, animals that are healthy there. It's not, it's not the like optimal and I, and I want those dams out. I want, you know, salmon back and all and natural flow. Um, but it, the place is not just human made like humans did a huge change to it and animals started readapting right away. Um, so it's, 
the story of Ripogenus Lake is the story of a, a very large human change through the dam and countless sort of adaptations, readjustments by all of the sort of, by the trees, by the fish, by all the things there. So like it is wild and not wild at the same time, but still we should work on re, you know, making it easier for salmon to be there. Uh, the flotation in the canoes uh, was probably a little bit overboard, um, but I knew that I would want to be paddling some whitewater. And I also knew that if I was to get in trouble on a lake crossing, that it would, it would help me there. Um, I don't like, and it was, the flotation I had was those large bags from my whitewater canoe. So like you could have gone away with something a lot smaller than that. Um, but I think that all canoes should have some level of flotation in them. So if they flip, they still float above the water. Uh, other questions or other thoughts about that distinction between stories and the experience. Gilby is saying that um, he wants to think more about it and is sort of noticing that he has a Jack London-y tendency, which I think, you know, we have so much great, rich, exciting literature that is this you know, story of struggle. Um, my niece who is eight years old, her, in, her language English teacher gave her a worksheet for how to workshop a story. And the, one of the questions was, what is the struggle that the main character is overcoming? And this is how you write a good story. This is what we're, you know, like, and this is our popular you know this is our culture so this is this is marcel's point is we enforce that this is you know the standard so i think we see that then come in as our stories of nature are those of overcoming um now judy is pointing out that it depends on the audience um that there's Sometimes it goes that way and sometimes it is, you know, possibly more connected. And having spoken with Judy before that is not surprising that she can tell stories of deep connection. So there's a question about uh, wilderness versus not wild. Um, how do we define wilderness when there is so little untouched land? Uh, this is, so this is part of that, the sort of talk about the dams and why I still wanna be able to call these places wild to some extent is I don't like, yes, especially when we take climate change into account, there are no wilderness, there is no wilderness left on earth. There's no place that is not impacted by humans. So if we, if we set that strict standard of what it means to be wilderness is to be completely separated from humanity, then it's, it's, it's not real. Um, if we shift to a sense of wild places are those in which the human influence is not the central or the major influence. Um, I think we can have more places that, that are wild. And if we look at a lot of sort of non-Western views of 
the sort of human nature split, it's, it isn't that hard distinction of the human place, the non-human place. It's this view of the, the village, the bush, which is often sort of a, you know, there's a mixing, that, that border is, is gray or is, is vague where, where it begins and where it ends. And there is human travel through this. So even when Europeans first showed up in, on this continent, there was no wilderness space. Every space was fully inhabited by humans and had been very actively managed by the humans who are living here. So, but it was managed maybe in a way that was not human as some something like so Jack is uh, bringing up that he thinks video can be a really effective tool for wilderness storytelling because it provides like a richer experience. Um, I, I agree. I think we might still with video be able to control it and make it a story of separation. So I think of the video free, the movie Free Solo. Um, and I see that movie as really following a separation, human overcoming story. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing feat. Um, but it, it, uh, you know, I think still can video can work into that mindset. We might make a distinction between narrative video and sort of other forms of it. So another. Another question I have for people um, is, and this goes back to the stories we tell of nature, and I've been searching for this, is a example from literature of an animal that is not a pet and is not just used by the author to forward the human story. So we have stories of personified animals. I don't think that counts because they're really just human characters. We have stories where a relationship a human has with an animal is used to kind of explain something about them, but just animals happening in a story. And it, I know it's a weird question, but it, it pushes back to this Marcel's point about the language we have, the stories we have, the, the media. And I think what, what we find is most, most of our literature, most of our movies are purely human stories. And there may be human in place, or there may be you know, particular animals coming in but we tell these stories where there are no bugs. There are no, you know, what was the last sitcom that had like squirrels running around in it? And so we like our sense of just normal ecological connection to the world is not in the sort of this place we learn to speak from this place we learn to think from. Um, so on this trip, you know, I saw five humans and, you know, tw probably 12 to 15 moose. I can not count how many birds I saw. And most of my days were you know, all of these animals just sort of randomly around me. And I, yes, I disturbed them. They made their way around me. But like, 
in telling the story of this trip, like it's, they are a part of it. They are a, a part of that place and th they aren't a part of my overcoming narrative. They're a part of just, they were there doing their thing. I was there doing my thing. And it's a, you know, I've been looking for examples of like, or, you know, almost role models of how do you, how do you explain like the animals along the way without making them in, you know, in this human story of figuring out the place? As someone pointed out, you know, the moose being disturbed by me is not a, a, a separation. It's just a different type of connection. Uh, someone is asking about participatory philosophy. Um, so this is, it almost started as a joke term, which probably a lot of things I say start out that way. Um, but it is, I guess, philosophy from an active stance. It is that there is the ideas that happen when you are doing a thing are not necessarily the ideas that seem legitimate when you are thinking about it afterwards. So participatory philosophy is the attempt to like take note of the thoughts as they happen in order to give them credence afterwards. And I know that it is this like futile thing and that I'm bringing analysis in um, but when it, when the focus isn't on precision, but is on like explanatory depth, I think that it, it becomes this thing where we can, the theory we leave with, ha the, the standard of is it good or not is, does it express what you felt? And I think the thinking while doing um, makes that more possible, or it's my attempt to make that more possible. So I think that it is not particular to expeditions or being in nature. I think that in a lot of ways, if we look at um, philosophy of race, gender, ethnicity, these attempts for people to explain their own identity I see that like what they're doing in a lot of ways is participatory philosophy they're saying this is the reality of my experience your theory doesn't have it your theory doesn't describe what I have experienced it doesn't mean it's wrong but it, it may mean that it's incomplete um, and um, to me, participatory philosophy fits into a school of philosophy called phenomenology, which is a fancy way of staying, studying experience. So Marcel was one of the early, is a phenomenologist. Um, and what's particular about phenomenology is they aren't trying to understand what is real. They're trying to understand the mechanisms, the sort of structure of how we experience the world. So has anyone ever had the experience of this is the time of year when it happens, you're driving down the road and there's something moving across the road and you think it's a squirrel, but then it starts moving in a not very squirrel way and it is a leaf being pushed by the wind. Has anyone has had that experience? It happens to me all the time, which might just be something about my perception being weird. So for the phenomenologist, they don't care that you are wrong. They're really interested to understand how that, how that shift happens and also how that like sort of projection, you're, you're guessing, you're estimating that was a squirrel. So in their method, what they do rather than focus on saying, oh, that wasn't really there, is just saying, let's focus on how that happened. 
that is your real experience. It's not a denial of the real world. It's not anti-scientific, but they're saying what, what we want to stop and think about is the way you experience that. So we will, the, the truth of experience is it really was a squirrel in your experience. And then it really wasn't. Your experience was not accurate, but that was your experience. So this need to explain the experience how it was, not tell you how your experience was wrong, um, is that sort of the basis of participatory philosophy. The danger of this is if we then claim what we experienced was what really happened. And that I don't know, like I don't think this method will, is always gonna get us to the, the real sort of truth behind our experience. But we, there is, a, this is something we have to bring to the discussion as well as like, what was our experience? So, you know, I don't see this as like leading to new discoveries in sort of the physical world, but, but probably, or my hope is a sort of clear understanding of how we experience that world. But that went way deep into the philosophy end. So <laughs> you're like, I, some of you might be like, I came here for a talk about a canoe trip. So um, I think you've left us with a lot to think about. And that's good. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Are there any other quick questions? We're getting near the end here. I just wanted to give one more chance for one more question. Oh. oh, we got a, we have a English teacher here. <laughs> Moby Dick is is interesting, but Moby Dick is an is an is a metaphor, an allegory. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much symbolism going on there that I think it it becomes a story of struggle. But at the same time, Melville is is like breaking down the the process he's doing so um and then annie dillard i think is an example and the other place people have pointed out is poetry mm -hmm. and i think poetry because of its non-narrative need like it's not this narrative needing to explain the plot animals can come in and out can be a part of a scene um And then, yeah, getting into brain science, which uh, is beyond my, my capacity, but it is quite interesting. Well, I think we could leave it at that, Alex. So thank you so much for this um, enlightening talk and your pictures were beautiful and your trip was lovely to uh, hear about and your thoughts too, so thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody.